So now we're going to make some use of these concepts of end diastolic volume, ejection fraction, stroke volume, cardiac output, and we're going to use them not in such a uh, school situation, but more as it would apply to your, your patients. So let's talk about the regulation of stroke volume. How does the heart decide or change how much cardiac output is happening? Keeping in mind how critical it is that the cardiac output from this ventricle has to be exactly the same as the cardiac output from this ventricle. But we're also th thinking about it is how this regulation of stroke volume and cardiac output might be influencing particularly our, our emergency room or ICU patients. There are three things that actually make sure that the two ventricles are the same, but particularly there is one thing that is most important for keeping them on the same page. So the three things that are really important are preload. Let's define preload once, right while we're here. Preload is essentially the pressure that's in the major veins that is forcing blood into the atrium. The more the atrium fills up, the more blood it will have to fill up the ventricle, and the more the ventricle will fill up. So preload is proportional to how fast blood is coming back towards the heart in the great veins, and preload will be proportional with the end diastolic volume. Increase in preload will increase end diastolic volume. Decrease in preload will decrease end diastolic volume. Right? Let's talk about contractility. We're going to be discussing uh, how the heart, the more it fills with blood, during ventricular diastole, the harder it contracts during the next systole. And that is true. However, you are able to administer medications to pay patients who have, do not have much blood in their ventricles, and you can force their ventricles to kind of overreact to the volume of blood that's there. And when you're doing that, you are modulating the contractility of the heart muscle. And then we have afterload. Afterload is not directly influencing what the heart is doing, not directly. Afterload is, and you should maybe write this down, the pressure inside of the great arteries. I always think of it mostly in terms of the aorta. The amount of pressure in the aorta that's pushing back, that is, is resisting the left ventricle sending blood out into the aorta. That's what afterload is. So preload, the blood vessels before the heart, afterload, the blood vessels after the heart, and contractility is modulating how the uh, heart muscle is reacting to any degree of stress. So preload. Preload is the degree of stretch on the heart before it contracts. And when we're talking about preload, this really is basically a description of what's called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. You know, I don't usually ask you to memorize names like this. Most of them aren't particularly useful. The Frank Starling Law of the Heart, I don't know who professors Frank and Starling were, and I don't care about their popularity. Here's why I want you to remember the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Someday, when some mean nursing school teacher or some PA or some smarty pants doctor in a hospital wants to put you on the spot, they may ask you, why are we giving this patient a blood transfusion or why are we giving this patient IV fluids, right? If you say we're giving the patient a blood tra transfusion because they lost a lot of blood in the accident, they will smirk at you and walk away, right? If you say, when someone says, why are we giving this patient IV fluids? They've lost a lot of fluids because they were throwing up. Again, they will smirk and walk away. You don't want them to smirk, right? Now, whenever a doctor or a nurse or whatever says, why are we giving this patient a blood transfusion? Why are we giving this patient IV fluids? If you don't know the answer right away, the best guess is Frank Starling Law of the Heart. As a matter of fact, if in that moment, 
you just say, well, because of Frank Starling, they'll look at you like you're a genius. You're now their favorite person and you get all of the, all of the benefits that go along with that. So remember Frank Starling, we're going to explain that by, a way, by the way in this lecture. So the preload is proportional to the pressure found in the vena cava and the pulmonary veins during the atrial diastole, right? The atrial diastole is when they're relaxing. So during atrial diastole, the more blood that's piling back towards the heart, the greater the preload. The bigger the atria will fill, the more blood they will fill up in the ventricle. And the more blood that's in the ventricle, the greater the end diastolic volume. So um, I should also put on here that preload is proportional to the end diastolic volume. As a matter of fact, some textbooks will say that the preload is the end diastolic volume. I wouldn't exactly put it that way, but more preload, more end diastolic volume, less preload, less end diastolic volume. Definitely true. Oh, it is written down here. Okay, so the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Let's think about a water balloon. We've got a very durable water balloon here. It's quite stretchy. All right, you know, stretchier than a normal balloon. And so we're going to put a hose in one end, we're going to fill it up, and we're just going to fill it up with a little bit of water, and then we're going to pull out the hose. What's going to happen? Well, some of the water is going to come out. Great. What if we really fill it up, okay? It's a pretty stretchy balloon, like it's hard to fill it up. We're really going to fill it up, and now we pull the hose out. Now what happens? Spring, right? So when you fill up a water balloon with a little bit of water and let it go, a little bit of water comes out. And then if you fill it up with a lot, not only does more come out, but under greater pressure. That in its essence is the Frank Starling law of the heart. When the end diastolic volume is small, then the next time the heart contracts, it only contracts about half. When the end diastolic volume goes more, then maybe it contracts 60%. If it goes more than that, maybe it contracts 70%, right? The greater the preload, the greater the ejection fraction, and those two things together will dramatically increase the stroke volume. Frank Starling. Ah, why should you remember Frank Starling? I'm sorry, my picture is in the way. Oops, let me just move that. All right, I'll move it, there we are, okay. So why you should remember Frank Starling. You've got a patient who is a two-year-old and she's had the stomach flu for a few days. And, and the, her parents were doing what they were supposed to do, but now she just won't wake up. So they brought her into the hospital. The doctor examines the baby. And now the doctor is saying that the baby's heart isn't working right. So what's happened? Now, I know that you and probably everyone else who hears this news thinks, oh, the virus that caused the stomach flu has attached your heart. No, that's not what happened. What happened was Frank Starling Law of the Heart. So let's see there. Oh, yeah, warning, I made up these numbers. These are not real numbers that would happen in a real baby. I was just trying to make the math easy. So let's look at what was going on when the baby was well. When the baby was well, her end diastolic volume was a healthy 50 milliliters. So the amount that filled up her little tiny heart, 50 milliliters, right? Her ejection fraction was 60% and that was healthy. So what was her stroke volume? Pause the video right now and calculate her stroke volume. I'll wait till you get back. No, I won't because you're gonna pause me. So her stroke volume was, 60% of 50, to calculate that, you would multiply 50 times 0 0.6, 0 0.6, okay? And you would get 30 milliliters. So every beat of her heart was sending out 30 milliliters. Now, when she was healthy, her heart rate was 80 beats per minute. So if her stroke volume is 30 and her heart rate is 80, then what is her cardiac output per minute? Pause me, please do the calculation. What was her cardiac output? It was 2,400 milliliters per minute because 80 times 30 is 2,400. Okay, that's when she was well. Now let's look what happened. The baby got really dehydrated. And since she got really dehydrated, 
her blood volume went down. And when her blood volume went down, her preload went down. So if her preload get, went down, what happened to her end diastolic volume? Her end diastolic volume went down. Now it's only 30 milliliters, right? When her end diastolic volume went down, because of Frank Starling law of her heart, her ejection fraction went down. So now instead of 60%, her ejection fraction was only 30%. So I want you to calculate, please, what is her stroke volume now, All right? Pause it, what's her stroke volume? Go ahead and calculate that. We're back, All right? Nine milliliters. So instead of putting out 30 milliliters every time her heart contracted, now her heart is only putting out nine milliliters, All right? Now, in order to compensate, her heart is speeding up. Sorry, gotta put the cat in the cat carrier bag here. So her heart rate has gone up to 140 beats per minute. Now, I want you to calculate what is her new cardiac output. Her heart rate is 140 beats per minute times my nine minutes. So please calculate that. And it is 1,260. Even though her heart is beating faster, because her stroke volume is so much smaller, she is not able to pump out enough blood to keep herself conscious, right? So what are we going to do? Well, we are going to replace her blood volume either by giving her a blood transfusion or in the case of the stomach flu, probably just giving her some IV fluids. When we give her IV fluids, her blood volume will increase. When her blood volume increases, her preload will increase. When her preload increases, her end diastolic volume will increase. Once her end diastolic volume increases, that automatically increases her ejection fraction because of Frank Starling. And then her cardiac output will increase as well. And one of the most gratifying moments in your day, when you're lucky, is to give IV fluids to an unconscious baby with the stomach flu and terribly worried patients, parents, and then watching her uh, come back awake within a few minutes because of the fluids that you administered. But please remember, when, when your teachers at nursing programs or PA programs or when doctors or when head nurses, when they ask you why, they are not accepting a stupid answer that any schmo off the street would say. Yes, we gave the baby fluids because she'd lost a lot of fluid. That's not what we're asking you. We're asking you, why does loss of fluids make her lose consciousness? Why does putting them back make her regain consciousness? What does that have to do with the heart, right? We're asking you to think more deeply. That's kind of cool. All right, we will pick up there at the next video.